Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Brian Alexander. I'm the forum's creator, host, and chief cat herder. I'm delighted to welcome you all here today. We have a terrific guest talking about an essential subject, and I'm really, really eager to start. But before we do that, let me just introduce the program. I'll explain a bit about uh, what it's about and what it hopes to accomplish and where it comes from, as well as where it's going. And then we'll bring our guest up. Now, I am absolutely delighted. Uh, to welcome uh, Kelvin Bentley. Uh, Kelvin is uh, Assistant Vice President for Learning at the Six Red Marbles Consultancy. He's had a great career uh, all over the place with higher education, everything from teaching to administration. He's a really, really clever thinker. He has the best Twitter handle of all time. Um, he's definitely someone that everyone should be paying attention to. And I'm just delighted, delighted to welcome him. Hello, Kelvin. Hello, Brian, and hello, everyone. Great to see you. Great, no, great to see all uh, to see all of us. I, I wish uh, I wish we were all kind of together at a conference somewhere and you know having these conversations in person. But uh, just thankful to be here and blessed to uh, to have such uh, an opportunity to talk with everyone today. So thank you. Oh, it's our pleasure. It's our pleasure. Listen, Kevin. When I when I ask people to introduce themselves, I, I try to avoid the usual academic. Well, I was born in 1945. Um, and what I ask you to do is to think ahead a bit um, and to think ahead in a way that illuminates you to the rest of us. So let me ask, um, for the next year, you know, thinking into 2021, what are the main topics that are uppermost in mind for you? And depending on, on what you're up to, what are the main projects you'll be working on? Yeah, no, that's a good question. Um, well, I mean, I think... I think there will be a lot of different things that we're going to be uh, focused on. I mean, I've been involved in, in online learning initiatives since 2001. And so it's been interesting just to, to see what the pandemic has exposed in terms of what's still needed to help all of us do our jobs uh, better uh, in terms of meeting the needs of our students. I think in 2021, though, things that I'm really hoping will have more traction will be things like competency-based education. I'm, I'm hoping that the new uh, Department of Secretary, the uh, Department of Education Secretary um, will provide more of an impetus for us to do more pilots and experimentation around CBE. Um, it's great to hear, for example, that Jobs for the Future and uh, the Competency-Based Education Network are already partnering to offer schools an opportunity to work within a collaboratory called the Equity Collaboratory. And uh, if I, and, and for everyone, if I mention something that you like to learn more about, feel free to uh, send me an email uh, later today at timelord33 at gmail. That's just a great, easy way to get a hold of me, or hit me up on Twitter at Black Time Lord. But my hope is that there will be more of that. I mean, I think really it's going to kind of come down to not just a new secretary but you know potentially a reauthorization of higher education um uh you know maybe you know uh putting um putting more uh emphasis uh emphasis on schools doing this work by you know sweetening the pot with title four funds and maybe making it easier to get title four funding for competency-based education initiatives so um, but I think that's that's one big thing that I'm hoping uh, will move forward. I'm hoping that also next year there will be uh, a light shown on what schools are actually doing to uh, better prepare themselves to uh, flexibly offer instruction, uh, whether it's you know face to face or online. Um, and more lessons learned. Uh, and right now that's really, that's hard information to get at unless you do a survey or a focus group. And then of course not everyone participates because we don't have a centralized way to collect that data across all school types. Um, and so that's also something that I'm hoping, uh, you know, maybe inside higher ed, uh, other publications, uh, Brian, you interviewing more uh, schools that are willing to kind of lift up the hood and actually show us soup to nuts what they're doing to, uh, from everything from faculty development to um, how data is being collected within uh, different systems to track how faculty are doing, how students are doing uh, with digital learning initiatives. Um, 
I also hope things like accessibility continue to be top of mind for institutions because, again, we're building all this content given the pandemic and putting it online. We're offering uh, remote instruction through web conferencing, but to what extent are we really making sure that all of our courses are accessible? Um, for example, people who want to talk for two hours using Zoom, uh, to my knowledge, I don't think there's really an easy way. <laughs> I don't think you know faculty are having someone do sign language, for example, while they talk, right? So that also worries me about um, ensuring the accessibility of the courses that we're creating. Um, other things too, I think, are just going to be uh, you know things like learning analytics will continue to be uh, important uh, on uh, access to online learning um, uh, services like tutoring and. And of course, proctoring, there, there's lots of debate and angst around uh, you know, surveillance technologies. And, and I, I go both ways on it. I, I get it. But at the same time, um, there are many, let's say, many math faculty, many STEM faculty uh, who love to give objective tests. So they'll cut you if you say, well, I'm going to make, you know, if you, if you take away their multiple choice exams, uh, you're in for a lot of trouble. And so we, we, in some ways, I think some of that dialogue around anti-surveillance uh, points the finger at the wrong people. Um, it's not just about the tech. It's really about, again, academic freedom, right? And academic freedom goes both ways. It could be for good as well as for angst and, and challenging us uh, in, in key ways. Um, let me pause there. But th those are some of the things that I'm thinking about uh, and concerned about uh, moving into 2021. Oh, and one other thing, um, I still think we need to tease apart what we're doing, um, remote instruction versus online versus high flex. We have to be much more transparent about what all those things mean and, and, and really giving faculty more time to be intentional about what they're going to do as a provider of digital instruction. Is that all? Um, <laughs> There's more, but th those are some of the things that I think about. And and it's not just because I've been drinking Coke Zero for the past uh, 30 minutes. So uh, just lots of things going on right now. Friends, you see, you see why I had to invite Kelly, <laughs> because this is the top of mind. This is literally right where he is all the time. Um, and I, I just furiously tweeted out a, a sketch of what he just said. And uh, already people are, uh, are, are pinging with questions and, and comments. Um, so um, I just, w w and we already have a question that's just come in, but let me just remind you all, I have plenty of questions to ask, but the key thing of the forum is for you to have the chance to ask your questions. So just go to the bottom of the screen and either press that raised hand button or press the Q&A button to, uh, to give us one. Uh, and in fact, here, uh, our first one we've got um, is from a longtime friend and uh, of the program, uh, a gentleman who suffers under any amount of abuse from me, uh, Tom Hames, coming to us from Texas. Uh, he has a great question. Hello, Tom. Hey. Hey, Kelvin. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Fellow Texan. <laughs> um, just down the road. Um, so my question was, you know, you said you wanted to get a lot more data uh, from institutions to try to figure out what's really going on. Um, I wanted to, you know, I was wondering, you know, how do you process that data? What are the criteria? I mean, what exactly are we measuring? I mean, one of one of the things that I, you know, like to go on about is the fact that a lot of times we put these artificial distinctions and categories on things. And when you were saying, you know, what is high flex? What is remote teaching? What is this? What is? I I refuse to have stringent categories. I call I call it teaching, and then I use whatever tools make the most sense to get the job done. And, mm -hmm. and if that is a high flex modality, and that gets me to my students, and that does what they need to get out of the, the process, then um, then that's great. And if it's in person, that's great too. But that's actually two questions because I asked the first question and then you kind of went on to the second item. But um, no, the, the basic question I have though is that, you know, if you're going to collect all this data, how are you going to make sense out of it? What kind of tools do you think we need? What, how do we set the definitions? How do we set criteria as to what exactly success looks like? Because I mean, this has been the perennial problem we right. talked about education. I mean, I, I remember having this conversation um, 
10 years ago when I was on a task force in the New Media Consortium, we were looking at learning analytics. And the, you know, at that point, we sort of went, the problem with learning analytics is that nobody really can define what learning is. So what the heck are we supposed to measure if we can't really figure out what success looks like, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the same thing's true if you look at this on a global educational scale, all the way down to an individual. Are my, am I uh, better, are my students better at the end of the semester than they are at the beginning of the semester? I like to think they are, but, you know, they learn, they get different things out of it for one thing. Mm -hmm. One student may learn how to do his homework on time. That's a win, right? <laughs> you know, another, another student may be advancing into high levels of thinking about government and, and politics that he never even dreamed of and goes off in that direction. Also a win, but, you know, but I was just curious what you had. Yeah, so so what I guess there's there's different ways to think about it. I mean, you know, if if I had venture capitalist money or if I had, you know, a, a type of grant, one of the things I simply want to be able to do is work with schools. Um, and this is not a function of what I do or what I've been doing at Six Red Marbles. It's just it's been kind of an ongoing interest. Given that I've been in online learning now for almost 20 years, I almost feel like we need we need a, a better way of just understanding the landscape, right? And to your point, sometimes you can't always qualify it as a as a number. Maybe it's more qualitative data, where we have a better sense across institutions of not just the number of let's say online sections or high flex sections, but what how are schools defining these things for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And what what is and what are the good practices across these institutions? We get, um, if we think about it, we only get glimpses of that based on people going to conferences, right? Hey, I'm going to WCET, I'm going to Educause. And, it, and we typically hear, sometimes we typically hear from the same people. We don't get a chance to really see across the continuum uh, of schools of, how are they grappling with all of this? Um, mm -hmm. And again, it's not easy to do, but I almost feel like there's a great opportunity for the right folks um, who are interested in this to somehow pull this information together in a centralized way so that we can almost have like a tableau distribution of information about schools, about the types of programs they're offering, how they're offering it, what challenges they're experiencing. Uh, and schools can maybe use that to get a better sense of, you know, who they may want to reach out to, to, to get better guidance. Um, maybe there's some collaboration opportunities. Uh, I know that the, the Hamilton Project, uh, for those of you who've been following that, the Hamilton Project just had a couple folks um, uh, write a paper that talks about, um, well, it talks about how we can actually meet some of the needs of some of our uh, uh, folks who are laid off by giving them credits that they can then um, uh, use at different institutions uh, for upskilling and reskilling. A part of this proposal at the Hamilton Project is also to have like a like a, a nationwide research center where we can actually kind of track. Um, some of this work. And so I almost feel like there needs to be a better way for us to understand the landscape of digital learning, everything from programs and, and how courses are offered, uh, even the types of technologies that people are using, um, challenges that they're experiencing, just so that we have a better way to understand this evolving landscape. Because again, right now, the way that we go about doing it, we get flashes of insights, but it's not, I would argue, it's not comprehensive enough to really be helpful for schools to help them, you know, make better informed decisions about a path forward for them if they want to be providers of digital learning. Yeah, no, I mean, if, if I, in an ideal world, I would have a, a huge database where we could, you know, pull together sets of you know data and evaluate it strength wise but also have a set of tools where different researchers like you or myself mm -hmm. can dig in and go okay if we look at it this way we see this picture if we look at it this that's what i think digital gives us in a way in terms of thinking about how you know that that to me is the the only way we solve a lot of these problems is just by getting a better picture the transparency will save us 
Yes. If we can get it done in time before everything collapses. <laughs> right. The transfer <laughs> is, is tough. And of course, it, it also involves right. getting leaders to, to sign up, to sign on to this. So I almost think about it in terms of like the, uh, the University Innovation Alliance and how presidents are kind of working together to find ways to collaborate and share data in ways that um, help those institutions don't, they, they engage in this work in ways that is non-competitive, right? So trying to do it in a way where everyone feels comfortable kind of, you know, lifting up the hood and not feeling like, you know, a school is going to take this information and somehow steal all their students, which I think is a part of the problem of why this type of idea hasn't really taken off. And when you bring it up inside member organizations, again, member organizations will maybe be able to help you get some of that data, but then not every school belongs to Educaz. Not every school belongs to OLC. And that's not necessarily a, a strike against them. It's just, you know, we need a better way to collect it across all institutions, not just subsets. Right. Well, that's a, that's a Tom, that's a typically deep and thoughtful question. And thank you for it. And Thank you, Kelvin, for that meticulous answer. I, um, I'm, I'm tweeting out uh, different points. I put a few of them in the text chat, but uh, you've already summoned a whole series of great projects and resources. Uh, friends, if, you, if you're new to the forum, uh, what we just did with Tom is a great example of uh, beaming someone on stage. So if you want to do that, just press that raised hand button. That's as easy as can be. Coming up now, we have an example of a question uh, from the question and answer box. And this is from the uh, splendid, hardworking Sarah San Gregorio. And we just put this up on stage so you can see it. Do you think that pushing for release time for our faculty would be something worth pushing for for administration? Yeah, yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I've been an administrator. You know, I've been a director. I've I've been a VP for academic affairs. I've been a you know an associate VP for e learning. Mm -hmm. um, what I've tried to do just in on my own time, I've been trying to. I've never really asked for like, you know, a sabbatical like time away from the office. What I've tried to seek out are, you know, certain leadership experiences, you know, like uh, the American Council on Education has uh, several if you want to aspire to be, you know, a campus president or something like that. I, I point to an experience that I had at Educause. And if uh, the powers that be from Educause are here, I hope uh, you bring this experience back. It was called the Breakthrough Models Academy. And that was a great, um, it was a great, it's probably one of the best professional development experience I've ever had because for a week we were brought to Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, you know, you, you had to apply, you had to of course get your supervisor to sign off on it, but it was a great way for you to work with peers. Um, and you were, you, and you had to kind of come up with like a cool innovative project, right? So you, um, so your team, had to kind of work together, craft this idea, uh, and, and really kind of define how it would serve the, the needs of students. And um, I think we need more of that. Um, and, and maybe again, that, that's something that can happen more organically inside the institution where maybe administrators can get, um, you know, some type of time even during the summer to think about the, the next generation of the institution, right? So how do we future-proof I hate to use that word, but future-proof the institution uh, in several ways, not just through digital learning. Maybe again, it's looking at um, different different elements of the institution, and so I think that could be a great opportunity. But for those of you who want to learn more about Breakthrough Models Academy, again, email me, or if you Google it, you'll find some of the uh, some of the examples of projects that came um, out of that. Um, uh, uh, um, that experience, which I think lasted for a couple of years before funding uh, ran out, but um, it really needs to be brought back. And and again, Educause is not the only organization that could do this. It could easily be something that uh, some of the other member orgs uh, take up. So, but it was probably again one of the the best opportunities because again it it got us away from just sitting in a in a conference room and listening to someone talk. Uh, it really kind of got people together to collaborate on projects that potentially had uh, the, the potential to be picked up and then scaled across institutions for those who were interested in it. 
I, I just tweeted at Educos. We'll see if, uh, if if they have a, a, a good answer to that. But Sarah did follow up. She said, uh, sorry, my question is more for the actual front loading time for course design. Oh, I'm sorry. So for, yeah, for, for course design, you know, I've worked, um, I've worked at institutions where, yeah, I mean, where faculty have uh, received, if they haven't received uh, release time, they have received um, uh, like a stipend. Um, and I think that's kind of the ongoing challenge, um, especially in community colleges where you're already teaching a 5-5 load at Tarrant County College, excuse me, where I served as a VP for academic affairs for one of the campuses for two years. Mm -hmm. um, it was scary. I, I, you know, there were faculty who actually told me, hey, Kelvin, secretly, you know, I'm teaching really a 7-7 load. Right. Like, don't tell anybody. I'm like, oh, my God, that's crazy. Yeah. So and we had to kind of like rope certain faculty back in because, again, teaching that many courses is, again, the quality of instruction. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it's like, you know, some of the articles that you read in the Chronicle and others where, you know, you talk to an adjunct who's like teaching at multiple organ, you know, multiple uh, colleges. And so that's happening every day at one institution uh, at community colleges. So. I think it's release time. I think it's a stipend or some other incentive to do the work. Um, but again, you know, with the pandemic, it'll be interesting just to see if schools who have been doing that cut back on that to make ends meet uh, in 2021. That's a good question. Um, yeah, uh, we just saw one uh, university where they um, uh, were pretty frank. Uh, and I, I want to say it's University of Colorado. I'm not sure that's right. Uh, where they said, yeah, we're we're uh, nudging about 60 tenured faculty towards retirement and we're going to replace them with adjuncts. And they were they were flat out about this. They said, that's that's how we're going to do it because we have to save money. Um, right. in, in the chat box, Jen uh, Obando says that, uh, uh, I feel like faculty aren't really motivated by stipend zone anymore. What they want are course releases. Um, I, Sarah, thank you for the great question. You really... Uh, um, struck a, a deep vein uh, of thinking here. Uh, you know, I, I usually have to tell people, I have to remind them to ask questions. Not here. The, the question is just filled up. I mean, it's it's incredible. I'm just going to relay these uh, to you. Uh, Kate Montgomery from SMU um, asks a really, really clever question. Uh, what are your thoughts on particular institutional types that have not typically provided digital learning, but have adopted in light of COVID-19? Do you anticipate continued use longer term? Yeah, no, that's a that's a great question. I, I um, so I I would hope so. I mean, I, I almost feel kind of like institutions have been literally stretched like rubber bands, you know, almost to the point where uh, they're stretched out, right? And so it, it's hard for me to think that schools, um, you know, will just simply go back to business as usual. Um, uh, because even with, you know, uh, promising vaccines being available, you know, 2021, 2022, it'll all be about, you know, again, restructuring budgets, right? And, and still trying to provide uh, flexibility to students in terms of how they begin or continue their education. Um, and, 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 and then also schools just trying to figure out, okay, well, how can we maybe adopt new models, you know, how can we maybe start with certain degree pathways, make them on the community college side, let's say more guided in terms of guided pathways, or mm -hmm. how can we do more competency-based education experiences for students? Um, and so um, so I, I think the many schools will continue to be different in some ways. My, uh, the asterisk next to that is the difference, I mean, because I think some schools still really need to do due diligence to do kind of a postmortem. I hate to use that word given COVID, but to really kind of just like be more reflective and say, okay, given the pandemic and given the changes we made, what worked, what didn't work so well, what data are we missing to then uh, decide, okay, what's the next chapter? Because, you know, so many in the spring, for example, so many faculty had to do remote instruction, right? Well, do we really want to uh, encourage remote instruction or do we want to do more online courses, um, asynchronous versus synchronous? So, um, and what are our what are our students telling us uh, as well, right? So Titan Partners, for example, has uh, 
um, you know, a couple of research studies that have come out kind of sharing how students and faculty fared uh, in, the, in, the, in the spring and also in the summer uh, that uh, are definitely worth a read. But, um, but my hope is that we'll be able to, to do more uh, to look at, um, again, what, what needs to happen moving forward um, um, versus, again, just saying, okay, the pandemic is over until another 100 years. Let's go back to 100% residential instruction, or let's just go back to just doing everything as we as we're normally doing. Um, SNU, for example, you know, is even saying, "Hey, we're going to cut our residential tuition uh, to ten thousand uh, dollars, you know, starting next year for incoming students." And uh, of course, SNU has lots of additional monies um, coming in from the online operation to help with that calculus. But yeah. I think some schools are going to have to say, "Well, geez, what are we going to do?" Um, especially given that students are saying, look, like, you know, um, I kind of like maybe online instruction or the flexibility of it. Um, oh my God, I'm, I'm, I'm woke in terms of the, the, the cost of what an education costs, right? I, I've been paying $50,000 a year. Maybe I shouldn't be paying that. Um, maybe I want the, uh, the $25,000 version if I take more online courses. So schools are going to be forced because of comp uh, competition and because of internal pressure from their own students to, to adopt some of the things that they have been doing, which will include digital learning uh, options. That's a, that's a great answer. Um, and, and Kate, thank you for the, uh, uh, thank you for the really, really good question. Uh, yeah. We have another question from Jane Wild at Linfield University that builds directly on this. I wanna put this up on the screen. Um, this is, uh, what risks and opportunities have arisen during the pandemic that you encourage us to pay attention to? Yeah, well, so I, I think some of the risks um, include things like, again, saying, hey, I have Zoom. Um, I really don't want to have to teach a, a, you know, take the time to teach an online course. So I'm simply going to do my hour or hour and a half lectures uh, and then I'm going to post some, you know, questions or I'm going to, you know, tell students to read something. I'm going to have them do assignments. So I, I think a big risk is that digital learning um, is not really fully embraced in terms of its, um, in terms of its capabilities. Um, you know, I, I think in some ways, some people will kind of just say, yeah, I'll just kind of do what I've always done without really kind of unpacking what they've done and really rethinking how they could actually offer it in a way such that the affordances of digital learning are actually more fully achieved, right? I think we all kind of agree that that's a huge risk, or at least I hope we can agree that that's a, that's a problem. Another risk is um, that we simply continue to be very siloed um, because right now another risk that I see is that we don't leverage, we think about technology as um, an enabler. I, I think it can enable us to do more around collaboration if we allow for it. Uh, and that's why I think sharing of data, sharing of good practices now more than ever is so important since so many more faculty are kind of coming uh, to uh, uh, coming to the table and saying, yeah, I teach online now because of the, the pandemic. So I think in some ways we really need to figure out um, how can we make our silos leakier, right? Uh, <laughs> hashtag leaky silos. I've used that before as just a way for us to think about how can we be much more collaborative than, than we typically are as higher ed. Um, I think opportunities, again, again, collaboration, uh, sharing of data. Um, I think there's some opportunities to also bring in our students and really ask them what's working because in some ways, especially in the spring, we were slapping things together quickly and trying to meet the needs of our students. And so there's a, there's a missed opportunity that I think that happens, especially in a very um, solo teaching model that we have where students are not brought along as, uh, as folks to kind of give us feedback along the way. Um, a lot of times, of course, we just ask students at the end, what did you think, when really we should be asking them that question every week that we offer the course. Um, um, or even when we're testing out new courses, having them beta test the course and tell us, okay, what's unclear, uh, what additional uh, instructional content is missing that might help me with this money point. 
And so there's a great opportunity as we're building new, these new digital learning courses to really bring students in as the, the stakeholders that we're trying to, uh, to, to help. That's everyone else. You can, you can see why I'm trying to figure out now how to just bring Kelvin on every week. <laughs> That's okay. First of all, first of all, uh, that was a great question. Uh, yeah, very great question. Yeah. Strategic vision of this. Um, and, uh, and, and second, I just did tweet out hashtag leaky silos. Just yay. Did. Thank you. Thank you. That that's basically the, the code name of this project that I would love to be able to, to, to start in some ways. Um, again, I just, I just need some seed money. I need people obviously to help, uh, schools to sign on and say, you know what, it's time for us to get more collaborative. Let's do it in a way that's not threatening to anyone, uh, to our leaders. But let's share what's working. Let's let's uh, let's help um, students and their parents and other stakeholders. Let 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 them know what we're doing uh, inside the ivory tower, right? And 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 see that we are trying to be innovative and that we that we do struggle with it, but that we are willing to fall fast and we're willing to share ideas to get better to meet your needs. Um, the more that we can do that, I think that that's where um, I think we'll be able to win more uh, acceptance of higher education, uh, more so than maybe we, we've we had uh, ever. And again, I know that's a big thing to throw out there, but I think, I think that's the timing and our use of technology can really help us uh, do that. I think that's right. And uh, you just got retweeted by uh, the Lay Call Group, that's uh, Liberal Arts Consortium of Colleges. So that's a potential source to talk to. Yeah, uh, we yeah. Just before, uh, I just want to reach back a bit to your earlier discussion about uh, data analytics that you have with Tom, uh, because Mark Rush, uh, who's a wonderful professor at the Washington Lee, uh, just said uh, had this question. I can't display it. It's it's from the chat, so I'll just read it out loud. Okay. Do existing data analytics really allow us to create a base or standard against which we can test online versus hybrid, etc.? Yeah, and you know, I I would argue it's, you know, I would argue that like any tool, there's an opportunity to leverage some of that data. I mean, I I think uh, Matt's point is a or Mark's point is a very good one though because what type of data, right? Like clicking through a learning management system, um, is that really helpful for us to know that? Um, uh, you know, there's data that comes from, uh, you know, students actually accessing an ebook. Uh, but, a, you know, a student might, you know, read a few pages and then go to 7-Eleven and get a big gulp and come back, right? So a lot of that data can be <laughs> very misleading in terms of engagement, you know, uh, student to, to content uh, engagement uh, data. So, um, so I, think, I think you're right. I mean, I think, um, I think we have to maybe tool the learning analytics because, for example, I think about it in terms of what if we could do a better job of even linking students who go to, uh, or students who let's say haven't uh, logged into the learning management system at all, um, who are failing. I mean, I think some of that data could still be useful as part of early alerts. Tutoring, uh, there are companies like tutor.com, for example, that has a way for faculty to track which of their students are actually using tutoring and for how long and they can also access sessions to find out what muddy points they're really struggling with in the tutoring session, which then an instructor can go, oh, I have this data now. Let me come up with supplemental instruction interventions, right? That might be helpful, not just, not just to this student, but maybe to other students in the class who maybe didn't go to tutoring, but are still struggling. So I think we have to be kind of, you know, we have to be somewhat parsimonious. We can't collect every bits of data, right? But there are certain things about the student experience uh, that we can collect. Um, maybe again, it's just, again, relying on survey data, you know, like, you know, when you go to a bathroom now, they have like the, the green smiley face, the yellow right. uh, face, the red face that says, oh, this bathroom is terrible. Maybe we need that where students are actually telling us, yeah, this week's material is awesome. You get a green smiley face versus you know someone who says oh my god like yeah. you know this co this course sucks this week especially because no one's participating or 
you know, the, you know, I, I don't have access to this ebook chapter. I'm going to give you a red, uh, you know, uh, growly face or whatever. So, so I think there, there's information about the student experience that we can still collect um, that could still be useful. Um, but it's going to be more pars it's going to be a parsimonious model that helps us predict mm. how we can do a better job of our of our courses that can predict uh, again student um, success in our course. Back around 20 years ago, uh, I used a, uh, a video conferencing platform. It was very rudimentary, but it had one interesting facet. Every person involved in the conversation was represented by a little two by two pixel box on the screen. So okay. you have 100 people, you just have this kind of ocean of these little blocks. Right. What you do is you could toggle your box color to your mood at that moment. Mm -hmm. So green meant this is cool, you know, yellow meant I'm not so sure, red meant I disagree or stop. And so if you had 500 people, the presenter could just quickly look at the watch and color, you know, and see, see how they were going. I mean, on a second by second basis, and I. Yeah. I don't, but that's 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 a, a a memory of the distant past. We have people here with great questions about the present and the future, and I want to make sure we get them uh, um, get their questions shared. Uh, so this is one from a colleague of mine at Georgetown. Uh, this is John Stites, uh, or Stites, uh, who asks: Is there any danger that schools will continue online post pandemic simply to generate revenue and climb out of the COVID financial hole? watering down online teaching in the process? Well, you know, in, maybe, um, I, you know, I, I don't think that that's outside of the realm, but I, I think in some ways it, it takes more, it takes two to tango, right? So it's not just about the administration saying, hey, we're going to offer online. It's what happens when you say, okay, we're going to allow faculty to teach online in, in, in stronger numbers, but the faculty who are asked to do it are a either not prepared, not motivated, um, and or uh, just burnt out, you know, from from having to do it um, because they're they're working on so many other uh, things in addition to trying to get these courses up and running. And so I think there there there's and that's why I'm saying that I think there's a huge opportunity to almost do some type of efficacy review um, and, and, and do it in a non-punitive way. So this is not, what I'm suggesting is not about um, evaluating faculty for promotion and tenure per se. It's about, okay, as an institution, how are we doing with online education in math or in, um, you know, in psychology, which is my discipline or in, in whatever area? And what are our students telling us about what their experiences are like? What you know what 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 types of instructional content seem to really be helpful to students across multiple sections of the same course what, you know what what content seems not to be uh, very useful have we done a good job even in terms of aligning our content in our courses regardless of modality with the learning objectives like are we telling students to read a 20 page journal just because we think it's awesome when really it has nothing to do with helping students master the learning objectives of the course. Mm. And so, you know, so I think about like Maria um, Anderson from Course Tune, right? Talking about aligning and quality matters too. Like we, we've been told we need to do a better job of aligning all of this. So I think in some ways, you know, it's, it's the design of the course that will get us in trouble, but it's also that facilitation, right? So how do we make sure that both, regardless of the modality, um, are in good shape. Um, and my hope is that moving forward, we will somehow wean ourselves off of how we teach now and really get down to competencies and sub-competencies and really show in a very clear way how everything in the course lines up with all of that um, in a very atomized way uh, versus how we do things now where it's like, okay, as an agenda, uh, as a, intro to psychology person, I just teach all the chapters <laughs> and just assume you're going to get everything when really I need to be much more prescriptive and, and, and have measurable things in the course that I want you to show me that you know how to do. I can see how this connects to your interest in uh, competency-based education as well. Yeah. 
John, that's a that's a great question, and uh, Calvin, that, that's a, a wonderful answer. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a, a question from uh, Jan Obando uh, at Stevens Institute of Technology, uh, which is kind of similar. Just now, what well, most institutions have been forced to adopt online courses or programs. I wonder what they will do need to do to set themselves apart from the rest of the pack. What new bells and whistles do you anticipate? Yeah, Jen, excellent question. You, I think you, you've really, you've really posed a question that I think a lot of institutions are kind of struggling with or will struggle with um, if they actually. And my hope is that they will actually spend the time thinking through. I mean, I think, I think in some ways the institutions that can somehow structure themselves to provide flexible learning experiences and and uh, so what I'm thinking about is something that. Um, Marty Baker Stein, who's the current provost and she's a uh, chief academic officer with uh, Western Governors University. In a recent uh, podcast, she talks about how even Western governors, right? They have 130,000 uh, 30, uh, students. They're huge. They're a mega university, um, yeah. um, if you believe in, in that idea. Mm -hmm. So even they are rethinking how they do things because they have um, you know, their, their work is about undergraduate degrees, graduate degrees, and they're even starting to kind of unbundle some of that to say, you know what, maybe we need to offer certifications that then stack into or lead to degrees for those who want it. Or maybe there are, you know, a couple courses that we can set aside that maybe students may want that will help with their ongoing, you know, lifelong learning objectives because they don't want the entire degree. So I think schools that offer flexible pathways for students uh, in ways where all the courses are available all the time. And I know that that's not very easy to do and will rely on you know, adjunct faculty, which again, you know, full-time faculty are like, oh, why do we have all these adjuncts? But, but you know, having hopefully the right balance between full-time and adjuncts so that you never have a, a student going, you know what? I wish I could graduate this semester, but this capstone course is only offered one time in the semester. And oh, by the way, Dr. Smith is on sabbatical for a year. So I'm gonna have to wait even longer to graduate. Like, I think students hit a lot of artificial um, bumps in the road. Mm -hmm. And so I think if we can make sure that that's a smooth process for all students, uh, it really will help with, you know, with the current focus on, diversity and equity and inclusion, right? So we, we tell students, you know what, regardless of who you are, we're going to give you a frictionless access to us. And we're going to provide it at a price point, hopefully that is competitive with our peers. Now, some like Harvard's, uh, you know, the elites will be the elites, but I'm worried about the state institutions, right? Where, um, you know, someone, um, you know, someone might say, well, you know, instead of going to my, my local state institution, I'll just go to a Capella or to a Western Governors or to a SNU. And that's what you, uh, you, the University of Mass uh, System President uh, said in an article uh, uh, maybe even a couple months ago, a couple, uh, several months ago, where he talked about how he was really worried about SNU stealing their lunch, basically, you know, where all these students locally we're going to SNU and not really going to UMass institutions. It's like, well, SNU does a great job of making frictionless access and also uh, working with students to make sure that they finish. And um, so it's gonna be about price, it's gonna be about wraparound student services. So not just having the online courses online, but the wraparound services, student success coaching, um, you know, providing um, access to online uh, services like tutoring, uh, so that uh, students have access to that. Uh, and then I think other things that will be uh, of a big hit will be mastery. So giving, given, uh, giving students credit for prior learning experiences, but also saying to students, you know what? You don't need 10 weeks. Uh, you know, maybe you don't need 10 weeks to finish my course or, six, or, or 16 weeks. Maybe you only need a third of that time. So schools that provide those flexible uh, entries and flexible exits outside of courses. I think they will they will be much more um, interesting to students moving forward. Um, not just traditional students, but m much more the adult students who need that reskilling and upskilling uh, that we hear about all the time. I hear that a lot. Um, 
I'm I'm conscious of time. Uh, we've got seven minutes, and there is a, a just a whole heap of questions that are just piling in. Uh, you've just triggered this this group like mad. Uh, <laughs> then I, I, I there's two. Oh gosh, there's so many. I'm going to save these and, and, and try and share them. I, I want to bring in one from uh, Portland State. Um, Sally, whose last name I always just struggle with, uh, Mudiamu, I believe, um, asks this question. Um, what about the international market? Um, you know, do we uh, um, do you have a sense of how this affects the global market for students? That many U.S. institutions charge a higher tuition to students from abroad. Yeah, Sally, that's that's a great question. That you know, my answer is is I'll, I'll have to preface it as saying and, and being honest and saying that's probably more outside of my wheelhouse of knowledge. Um, because I, I don't think I've actually done a good job of tracking what's going on in terms of the international markets. I mean, what I would say is that um, my hope is that international students will be more energized given the, the change in administration and that we'll you know, find uh, ways to, uh, again, bring back students we lost or maybe get additional students. Um, and I think to be competitive, yeah, it'll, it'll be interesting just to see what schools are willing to do so maybe there could be a nice hybrid approach to save on costs where some of the courses, again, are, are more online and then maybe junior and senior level courses or later courses in a program. Uh, we bring students on campus, you know, to, to have those experiences. Or maybe the model is something where, you know, we, we meet somewhere, you know, outside of the United States. You know, maybe we say to some of our international students, hey, we're going to go to London and we're going to have some learning experiences there, um, or we'll come to you, um, you know, uh, because again, like uh, schools like uh, Univers uh, University of Mass, um, I'm sorry, University of Maryland Global Campus, right? Already, mm -hmm. many other schools do this too, right? Where they send faculty uh, to countries to teach, and so hopefully we can find a way to to make it um, to to make it affordable. Um, but uh, yeah, it'll d definitely be something worth uh, worth watching. Um, uh, you know, moving forward, especially with Biden and Harris coming in in January. Thank you, Sally, and and Sally, thank you very much for uh, for being so kind to me, um, as well as for asking a, a brilliant question. Uh, thank you, uh, Kelvin. Um, I, I'm 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 struck with an embarrassment of riches with all these questions. I I want to bring in one big one uh, so that. Okay. Been used to wrap everything together in a huge bow, um, and this is from one of Tom Hames's colleagues at uh, Houston Community College, uh, Margie Ricks, and uh, this is a huge one. Uh, Margie asks, uh, "What do you think the future of education will be in ten years? Will we ever become mostly brick and mortar again? And what kind of students will we be teaching?" Yeah, that's a great question. I, I think uh, a lot of the students that will be teaching, uh, you know, in the ten years will be even they will be, I would say in some ways, they will be more technology savvy than we give uh, current, uh, you know, K through 12 students credit for. I think sometimes we assume that our current students now um, are, are, are super savvy in terms of technologies. And, and uh, I, I would argue uh, they're not. I mean, I think they know what they know, but I think in 10 years, I think we'll see, my hope is that we'll see more students will have uh, opportunities to to take online courses, hopefully again, not because of a, a major disaster like a pandemic, but because in K-12, for example, there will be uh, you know more opportunities for personalized learning, mastery of learning. Um, and so I think because of that, there'll be an expectation once they get to college, right? Such that they're gonna want uh, more flexible, more personalized learning experiences once they do college, whatever college will be like for them. Mm -hmm. I think in some ways we're not going to have, I mean, I think the brick and mortar ideal that we have for many schools will be very different. And so maybe instead of like, you know, schools having uh, the large uh, footprint that they have now, maybe there will actually be smaller versions um, that will be available, um, you know, within, uh, within certain regions where students will again, balance their time between these smaller satellites versus being on a main campus uh, for the entire period of time. But I think it will be very fluid. I think students will will float between 
being at home, doing stuff at home, coming to campus when needed. Um, but the whole residential, I, I, it'll be interesting just to see what happens to the residential experience. I, I, I think that some students might say, well, I really want a redefinition of that. Maybe it's you know more study abroad. I want upfront versus later. Maybe I actually want to have more micro internships earlier on, so that you know I'm not on campus, but maybe I'm actually you know uh, my campus is you know working just outside of Google uh, to do uh, work for them, or maybe I'm doing it remotely, uh, such that I don't really need to focus on you know being on campus. So um, so that's what I think I see within the next ten years at least. That's a remarkably remarkably elegant answer. Um, to uh, a ginormous question, uh, and you have just you've covered an enormous amount of ground, Kelvin. Somehow you've also taken us to the end of the hour. Um, oh, I'm I'm so sorry. I'm, and I I, I hope um, you know maybe we need to do like a part two after the New Year's, right? And uh, and for those of you who ask questions and we didn't get a chance to uh, to address those, feel free. Um, you know we can collect them, but you can also just email me at timelord33. I'd love to just try to um, either schedule time to talk with you one-on-one, -on -one, or I could also just try to email you as well, because I, I do want to address as many questions as possible. Well, that's really, really very, very kind of you. Uh, friends, if you haven't looked at the bottom left corner of the screen, you should see two buttons. It's a kind of a yellow tan color um, button. One of them is a link to uh, Kelvin on Twitter. He has the best handle, Black Time Lord. And there's also a link to uh, his uh, paperly um, uh, report, which is really, really great. Uh, so if you'd like to follow up with him, you've got his email address. Um, Kelvin, I'm so glad we could host you. I'm really looking forward to bringing you back as soon as possible. No, thank you. It was my pleasure. And just thanks, thanks uh, so much for the opportunity. It was great talking with you and, and everyone. So be, please, everyone, please be safe and enjoy the holidays. And uh, thanks again. Thank you. Thank you. Don't go away yet, friends. I uh, just want to tell you what's coming up over the next uh, the next few weeks. Um, well, just to remind you that uh, uh, oops, uh, that we are coming up on um, the uh, uh, the end of um, of uh, the year, which means we have two sessions coming up: uh, one on work life COVID balance, and another one on how campuses grapple with COVID and uh, racism. Uh, looking ahead into 2021, we have a whole bunch of great topics coming up in just the first uh, two months of that year. Now, if you'd like to join our book club, because we're reading an important novel uh, on the future of climate change with a role for education, uh, just go to uh, my blog and look at the book club there. The book is Ministry for the Future. Uh, and if you want to keep talking about all these subjects, we've got all kinds of social media angles. Uh, you can see here, especially Twitter, and Twitter has just been on fire for the past hour. Um, and uh, if you'd like to go into the past and look at our previous conversations about the future of education, including everything we've talked about so far, from competency-based education to pedagogy, just go to tinyurl.com slash FTF archive. Um, now, this has been a great conversation. Uh, let me just echo our esteemed guests' final words. Thank you all for your participation. Please be safe during this extraordinary time, and I hope to see you online. Take care. Bye-bye.